Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Command Valley Podcast. I'm your host, Landon, and today I'm going to be bringing you a deck deck for Corvold Fey Cursed King. Before I get into the video, be sure to subscribe to our channel if you aren't already so you don't miss any of our awesome deck tech videos that come out every Monday. And also, if you are subscribed, stay tuned for our future gameplay videos. Corvold Fey Cursed King is a legendary creature dragon noble that costs two, a black, a red, and a green. He has flying, and whenever Corvold Fey Cursed King enters a battlefield or attacks, you have to sacrifice another permanent. And whenever you sacrifice a permanent, you put a plus one plus one counter on Corvold and you get to draw a card. And he starts out as a 4-4. So at first glance, it might seem like a big drawback to sacrifice a permanent whenever Corvold enters a battlefield or attacks. But that second ability that makes it so whenever you sacrifice a permanent, you draw a card and put a plus one plus one counter on Corvold definitely gets out of hand. Uh, I have drawn anywhere between five to 20 cards in one turn, and it definitely is a really powerful strategy, and I think it's definitely worth that downside. And that downside with the right build around could actually be turned into a, an upside. So the strategy that I've chosen for Corvold is an aristocrat strategy, which means we are generating tokens, both creatures and non-creature tokens to sacrifice for incremental value or a lot of value all at once. Before we get into the big flashy spells that make a ton of tokens or do really cool things, we need to go over the baseline of any good commander deck and that's the ramp. The ramp for this deck, I've selected between instants and sorceries, creatures, and some enchantments. So I'll just go over all the, the suite of instants and sorceries. So we've got Cultivate, Farseek, Sky Shroud Claim, Rampant Growth, and Kadama's Reach. All of these are really good ramp spells that will pull a card from your library and just put it right onto the battlefield. Next up, we've got Hara, which is an instant that costs two and a green. It has an, as an additional cost, you have to sacrifice a land, but you get to search your library for two lands and put them right onto the battlefield. So with Corvold out, you're also gonna be drawing a card, which is, it's just a great extra little trigger. Next up, I'm running a mixture of mana dorks or creatures that have an activated ability that make mana and some creatures that will just search for a land. We've got Lanwar Elves, Elvish Mystic, and Elves of the Deep Shadow, which are our mana dorks. And then we've got Secura Tribuilder and Wood Elves, each of which have the capacity to pull a land from our battlefield and put him into play with secure a tribe elder also triggering Corvold to let us draw a card if he's out. Next up for the enchantments and artifact ramp, I'm running Cryptolith Rite, which gets busted when we have a whole bunch of creature tokens. It says creatures you control have add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Then we have Growing Rites of Itlamok, which lets us find a creature from the top four cards of our library with its enter the battlefield trigger. And then at the end of our turn, if we have four or more creatures, it flips over into a pseudo Gaius cradle, which adds a green for basically every creature we control. Next up, we're running Soul Ring because it's kind of an auto include and Talisman of Resilience. It's the only artifact that I'm running that taps for color because green and black are like some of the colors that we want to have access to the most. Okay, now we have a whole bunch of lands in play. We need to figure out what to do with all of this mana. The idea of the deck, like I said earlier, is aristocrats. We want as many ways of making tokens as we can. And I've separated our token makers into three categories. We have token makers that make a whole bunch of tokens all at once. We have token makers that will make tokens passively. And then we have permanents that trigger, that we can kind of arbitrate how many tokens they make or, or affect it with other abilities. So let's go over the big flashy ones that make more than one token when they enter the battlefield or when we cast them. We have Arachnogenesis, which two and a green, you put X, one, two green spider tokens with reach onto the battlefield where X is the number of creatures attacking you and then you prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn by non-spider creatures. This is one of the best cards in the deck. Not only does it count as a fog, but it also gives us an insane amount of tokens depending on what's coming at us. Next, we have probably the best card in the deck with Avenger of Zendikar. Any chance that we get to tutor, we want to be finding Avenger of Zendikar. It's an elemental creature that costs five and two green. And when it enters the battlefield, we put a number of zero one green plant creature tokens onto the battlefield for each land that we control. Since this deck is running many ways of putting lands onto the battlefield, oftentimes Avenger of Zendikar is gonna be making us anywhere between five to 10 plants. Next, we're running Fungal Sprouting, which is three and a green, and we put X1 green sapling creature tokens onto the battlefield where X is the greatest power among creatures we control. With Corvold getting a plus one plus one counter every time we sacrifice a permanent, Corvold's gonna get huge. Uh, I have sometimes put upwards of 20 to 30 tokens onto the battlefield with this. It gets nuts. Next, we're running Brass's Bounty and Grave Titan, which are just other ways of making a good amount of tokens with Brass's Bounty making treasures. Just to note, every time you sacrifice a treasure for mana with Corvold out, you will be drawing a card and adding a mana to your mana pool. Next, let's go over the ways that we have of making an incremental amount of tokens or like a steady amount of tokens. We have Awakening Zone, Tender Shoot Dryad, Creekwood Liege, Tireless Tracker, and Curse of Opulence. 
Basically, in effect, all of these cards will be making at least one token every turn, kind of depending on the circumstance, but more often than not, we're getting a token every turn with these cards. Next, we have some ways of kind of manipulating the amount of tokens that these cards can produce. We have Pawn of Ulamog that triggers every time a non-token creature that we control dies, we get to make a 0-1 Eldrazi spawn that we can tap and sacrifice to add a colorless to our mana pool. So we can kind of control this by sacrificing a whole bunch of non-token creatures if we need to to make a whole bunch of Eldrazi tokens. And then we have Pitiless Plunderer that says whenever another creature you control dies, we get to make a treasure token which treasures in this deck get absurd because we're sacrificing them for mana and also drawing a card with Corvold. Then we have Uvenwald Mysteries and Golgari Germination, which both will just make a steady amount of tokens throughout the game. So after we've set up our token engines and we're making a consistent amount of tokens, we have Corvold out. We've got, you know, eight or nine different creatures on the battlefield with our tokens. We need to find a way of sacrificing them because just sacrificing one every turn to Corvald attacking is not enough value to get our win cons out. So let's go over the ways that we have of sacrificing any number of, of creatures at once. We have Ashnod's Altar, Carrion Feeder, Yeheni, and Viscera Seer. Each of these cards have an activated ability that let us sacrifice a creature with no cost and without having to tap the card. So we can sacrifice any number of creatures at any time and they all have some slight benefit, but really we're looking for the sacrifice outlet. Next, we're running some other types of sack outlets that aren't as efficient as sacrificing creatures, but give us more value for sacrificing a creature. We're running Plague Crafter, which when it enters the battlefield is going to make everybody sacrifice a creature. We have Priest of the Forgotten Gods that we can sacrifice two other creatures to have any number of target players lose two life, sacrifice a creature, and we get a draw card and add two to our mana pool. So it can only sacrifice a certain amount of creatures at once, but we get way more value out of it. And then we're running Witch's Oven, which we can tap to sacrifice a creature and make a food token. Then if the sacrifice creature's toughness was four or greater, we get to make two food tokens instead. We're also running Skull Clamp, which technically doesn't trigger Corval because Skull Clamp being equipped to a creature killing it isn't sacrificing it, but it's such a good card in Aristocrat strategies that I'd feel remiss if I didn't add it into this list. The next category, we're going to talk about other payoffs for death triggers because we can't just expect to rely on Corvold all alone to give us value for sacrificing things and nor should we. We never want to rely too heavily on our commander because their people are going to see him as a big target and he's going to get removed. So some other ways that we have of benefiting from things dying are Fecundity, Smothering Abomination, Midnight Reaper, and Grim Haru Specs. And I've kind of separated these into two different categories. Smothering Abomination is two and two black for an Eldrazi with flying. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you have to sacrifice a creature. And whenever you sacrifice a creature, you get a draw card. So it's kind of the same effect as Corvold, but it only triggers off of creatures, but it triggers off of token creatures as well, which is why I've included it. And then Fecundity is in a green enchantment. It costs two and a green. And whenever a creature dies, that creature's controller may draw a card. So just a note, this will affect your, your opponents, but we are going to be taking, we're going to be abusing Fecundity way more than our opponents can. Next up, I'm running Midnight Reaper and Grim Haru Specs, which they both have a very, they have the same casting cost and they effectively have the same ability and they actually both have the same power and toughness whenever another non-token creature that we control dies we draw a card and midnight reaper will also deal us one damage so this doesn't trigger off of all the tokens that we're making but we're also running a high density of creatures so it's going they're going to draw us a lot of cards throughout the game next up let's go over our win cons or how this deck is aiming to win Sacrificing a lot of cards and drawing a lot of cards is great, but that doesn't necessarily win us the game. I've separated these pingers, you can say, into two separate categories. The first category are the Blood Artist types effects. One death trigger equals pinging one opponent for one life. Blood Artist and Mayhem Devil have a similar effect. Whenever one of our permanents or whenever one of our creatures dies, they're both going to do one damage to our opponents. Mayhem Devil is a little bit more flexible. It says whenever a player sacrifices a permanent, he deals one damage to any target. But more often than not, we're pinging our opponents with this. But they only, they only do one damage per one death trigger. Next up, we're running Zulaport Cutthroat and Poison Tip Archer, each of which trigger off of any creature dying, but they do one damage to each of our opponents. So for one trigger, we're pinging all three of our opponents. So they're a little bit more efficient and we can abuse them a little more and end the game quicker. But if there are games where we can stack these on top of each other, we're just gonna be winning so much faster. Also as a plan B, it is sometimes viable to hit your opponents in the face with a giant flying dragon that is absolutely massive. And I have won games with Corvold with that, but that doesn't happen every time because when he gets super huge, he's likely gonna get removed. The next point of this deck, which is a very powerful strategy, is the recursion. Oftentimes it's not enough to cast one Avenger of Zendikar and get that trigger once. 
Sometimes you're gonna have to do it two or three times to actually close out the game. So I'm running cards that are going to let you reanimate Avengers Endicar from the graveyard and get that trigger again. So Blood for Bones is a sorcery, costs three and a black. As an additional cost to this spell, you have to sacrifice a creature and you get to return a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield and then another creature from your graveyard to your hand. So how this works is you can sacrifice Avenger of Zendikar to the cost for Blood for Bones, reanimate it, and then reanimate another creature. Oftentimes, I would choose Eternal Witness because when it enters a battlefield, you get to return a card from your graveyard to your hand. You can select Blood for Bones and start the cycle all over again. Next up, there's Regrowth. For one of the green, you can return a card from your graveyard right back to your hand, which is good if you have enough mana to recast an Avenger of Zendikar. And then Victimize, it's two and a black, and you choose two creature cards in your graveyard, and then you sacrifice your creature and you return both of those creatures back to the battlefield tapped. So that's just another way of getting an extra trigger off of Avenger of Zendikar. Next up, I'm running a couple of cards that will let us search our library for Avenger of Zendikar and put it right onto the battlefield. I'm talking about Avenger a lot because he is probably the best card in the deck. He's an absolute powerhouse, and with Corvold out, he can draw you so many cards to find the pingers, to find the death payoffs, to find something else that will make a whole bunch of tokens, or even find the ways to reanimate Avenger of Zendikar. So we're running Pattern of Rebirth, which is an enchantment that when the enchanted creature dies, you can search your library for a creature card, then put it right onto the battlefield. And then Green Sun Zenith, you put whatever you put into X, you can go and find a creature with X's converted mana cost and put it right onto the battlefield. The creature does have to be green, but that doesn't matter. Avengers and a card is green. And maybe you need an Eternal Witness or you need maybe another utility creature. You can search for Poison Tip Archer if you need the Pinger. And then we're also running Eldritch Evolution, which is you sacrifice a creature and then you can search your library for a creature with converted mana cost X or less, where X is two plus a sacrifice creature's converted mana cost. So if you have something that costs five, you can go and find Avenger that costs seven and put it right onto the battlefield. Last but not least, we're going to be talking about the interaction and protection. Obviously, Corvold is going to represent a huge threat to our opponents. I'm running a couple of ways to protect him, but this deck produces so much mana, it's not the end of the world if he gets killed once. Oftentimes, you'll have enough to cast him, and sometimes you can let him go to the graveyard because we are running ways of reanimating things from the graveyard. But I'm running Blossoming Defense and Swiftfoot Boots. Blossoming Defense is an instant that gives Corvold hexproof or gives any creature he hexproof which can be good if somebody tries to spot remove Corvold. And then Swiftfoot Boots, it's an equipment that gives Corvold haste and hexproof, just another way of preventing spot removal. Now going over the ways that we have to interact with our opponents, I'm running Death Sprout, Assassin's Trophy, and Putrefy, each of which are spot removal at instant speed. That means we can respond to a threat at instant speed, and Death Sprout will also let us search our library for a land and put it onto the battlefield tapped. So it's at the same time a kill spell and a ramp spell. Going over more ways we have of interacting and stopping our opponent's plan is Grave Pact. It's an enchantment that costs one black black. Whenever a creature you control is put into a graveyard from play, each other player sacrifices a creature. So imagine we've made a whole bunch of sapperlings with Avenger of Zendikar and we have a sack outlet and our opponents have an overwhelming board state where they have a lot of creatures. With Grave Pact out and a Sack Outlet, we sacrifice all those tokens to our Sack Outlet, and Grave Pact is gonna trigger for each one of those token creatures, and we could wipe our opponent's boards. I'm also running Crux of Fate, which is a board wipe. It's a sorcery that costs three and two black, and it has two modes. We can either destroy all dragons or all non-dragons. It's kind of convenient and cute that Corvold is a dragon creature because he will evade this board wipe, which is pretty valuable. For brevity's sake, I'm not going to be going over every single card in this deck. I don't feel like it's necessary to, to talk about every single card as a lot of selections that I've made are just meta and how I like to play this deck. And I'd like to leave it up to the viewer to decide on some of the, the few remaining card slots what they'd like to run. I also understand that a lot of cards that I'm running right now aren't super budget. And there are lots of ways that you can you can make this budget. And there are there are cards that you can substitute in and out for. And having this in mind, I will be putting a link in the description to my tapped out forum where I will be putting all the deck text that I do personally. And if you have a question on, on budget or how the deck plays itself or how to use certain cards better that maybe I didn't mention in the video, feel free to make a comment there or in the comment section of this video and I'll try my best to personally respond to each one of those. We really appreciate your guys' feedback. We'd like to know how we can do better or maybe how we can better serve the community or how we can make more deck techs that are more relevant to you. So don't hesitate to leave a comment down below with what you'd like to see. And with that, this episode's coming to a wraps. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.